is movie talk time. We are talking about the battle that rages on between Spielberg and Netflix. On top of that, we've got casting news for the new Ghostbusters movie and Shazam, a new trailer. Is it funny? Is it too funny? I don't know. I kind of liked it, but my panel might think otherwise. You guys are going to have to wait to the end of the show to find out because that's our last story for the day. Haley Fouch, John Ro- Mr. Roca, yes. you didn't get the dress code. We were getting no, fancy I know. today. No, no, I wore my Beatles <laughs> uh, rubber sole shirt that I bought in Liverpool uh, when I was there visiting. So that, that this is me dressing up. This is as much as I go. You could have thrown a jacket on. Yeah, I know, it's fair. And if I was going to the Captain Marvel premiere, maybe I would have. But I'm only going to the screening, so I'm wearing regular clothes because I'm a man of the people. That's right. <laughs> well, we are quite pumped. But did you have a good time on your trip? We're happy to have you back, oh, seriously. Wait, look, thank you for walking me back. And I did have a great time on the trip. It was nice to take a break and not you know deal with all the controversies that are going on in the world. It was weird to be out of the country for the Oscars, but it was great watching y'all's coverage so that was a lot of fun to see the back and forth and people were tweeting at me oh you should be there to go at Jeff and uh, uh, Scott Mance for uh, loving Green Book so much so it was fun <laughs> but overall great trip and I'm glad to be back very glad you had a good trip Thank always you. happy to see you Haley we're going to have fun you. tonight yes it is uh, with a very heavy heart though that I have to kick off this show on a somber note because we lost somebody in the industry today and it is truly a heartbreaking scenario Luke Perry has passed away as someone who grew up watching 90210 over and over again. It was a big <laughs> family thing where every time that show was on, we all gathered around. I've just, I've been following his career since I was a teeny tiny child. And when I heard the news, it was, it was devastating to say the least. It's hard to lose someone no matter what, but someone at such a young age like he was is mm. really incredibly unfortunate. And I kind of just wanted to send my best to his friends, his family, his fans. And Roke, I know you had something to say as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is, you look at this 52 years old, it's really an untimely passing when they use that phrase, this is what they mean. And, you know, having a massive stroke at such a young age and then passing away from it, leaving such a legacy with a lot of people, 902 and Opera, you know, it's it's a thing that spans generations. You know, a lot of people were still discover 90210. There was talk about them, there's talk about them bringing back the old kids characters to bring it all back and that would have been great to see Luke do it again. The thing that I really loved about Luke Perry, to be honest with you, is looking at how he transitioned out of what have, could have been a very limiting role, a stereotype thing, where he's a teen heartthrob, what is he going to do? But he always had something more to offer and you saw as his career progressed what um, characters and roles he found himself doing and how that showed and expanded his talent, especially on Oz or Jeremiah or the turns on SVU or on Criminal Minds. You really got to see the depth of this man as an actor, and it's a shame that he passes before we had a chance to really embrace him once more and maybe move into another role that could have really showcased his talent as an even older actor. It really is a heartbreaking mm. scenario, but in this industry, when you make such a strong mark in mm. terms of your content and also how you treat other people just in real life, and I've only heard the best of about him mm -hmm. in interview situations where a whole bunch of my friends posted pictures with him from things like Comic-Con for Riverdale recently and all all different things. I've just only heard the most loving, wonderful things. So he is gone, but he most certainly is not forgotten. No appropriate transition, but we got to make our way to our first story of the day. And as always on Mondays, that's when we cover the box office from the weekend. So How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World, wound up at number one yet again with another $30 million. And that means it topped Tyler Perry's Medea Family Funeral, which still made a really great $27 million. But that winds up marking the Medea franchise's fourth biggest opening. So it's the last movie, and they concluded it strong there. Then, of course, we had Alita Battle Angel at number three. That one made another $7 million. The movie has not had the biggest domestic box office, but it's actually doing pretty well worldwide right now. I think it's got a grand total of something like $350 million worldwide, thanks to $278 million overseas. And then our other their new wide release of the week and poor Greta only opened up in eighth place because it made just 4.5 million dollars so not the hottest start for that one right there uh, but let's go back to Medea a little bit Roca I know yeah. you've got a take on this one <laughs> are, are you surprised that this movie opened as big as it did I want to keep being surprised because it, it beat the expectations it was expected to be only 20 it's the ninth Medea film uh, they're trying to maybe talk him Tyler Perry come back to a tenth one 
The fact that it opened at 27 million is incredible. And I don't know if that's a positive or a negative in terms of the box office overall, you know, because it's been trailing, uh, 2019 has been trailing in box office wise from a number of years, some of the worst we've seen in quite some time. So you go, okay, great, it made 27 million. But I think it also pushes the fact that Tyler Perry is still a force. You know, he's the butt of jokes sometimes. That man is still a force with a lot of moviegoers, black moviegoers especially, obviously, and they come to see his film to support what he's doing because there's the, there's a dearth of it in the industry and out there for people to see. So I think that's a positive overall. But I do want to also give some love to Alita Battle Angel because, look, yeah, it, it, some reviews, uh, including, including mine, a bit uneven the film itself, but hoping that it would make some kind of noise overseas, and it really did. So now the conversation is, well, hey, look, if we get a Pacific Rim sequel mm -hmm. that didn't do that well domestically but did well overseas, then we should absolutely get an Alita Battle Angel sequel. I hope with a better story, some more fleshed out characters, and hopefully this can actually become a franchise in the long run. I don't know. Now that you bring that up, I'm like, which do I think is more likely to happen? Tyler Perry to come back for another <laughs> Medea movie or an Alita sequel? Um, I haven't seen Alita myself, so I'm not ready to weigh in on that just okay. yet or whether I want one at all. But mm -hmm. with Tyler Perry and Medea, I was very surprised. Yeah. I thought that we were seeing a a bit of a downward spiral. I mean, I knew not to doubt it completely, but I thought it was going to come in on the lower end of expectations around something like 20 million, maybe in the high teens. 27 is a nice number. And then on top of that, it has the A minus cinema score. So I think oftentimes we see these movies have big weekend two drops, but I wonder if that's going to be the case with this one. And if it winds up holding strong, I'm sure Lionsgate is going to do everything in their power to keep making more of those movies. So I am very pleasantly surprised to see how it did this weekend. Haley, the way I want to spin this all for you right now is we were talking about this a little earlier. 2019, we are two full months in at this point, and we haven't really had like a really big hit so far. And when I say a really big hit, I'm talking about things like north of 100 million for an opening weekend. Given how things have gone thus far, and particularly this weekend, do you think that is going to help or hurt Captain Marvel next weekend? It can only help, right? I mean, if you look at those numbers we just put up on the screen, you know, you've got two movies that are in double digits and three movies that are in single digits of millions that they're raking in. So that's a lot of space at the box office for Captain Marvel to come in and make a big show. It's also a matter of, I think, People are kind of hungry right now for a movie that mm. that drives the conversation. Maybe the way that, like movie scandals have been driving the conversation. <laughs> like we want something we can all come together and love and talk about. So, I think that Captain Marvel's in a, a great position to perform next weekend. It, it'll be interesting. It was surprising last year when Black Panther ended up ultimately beating out Avengers. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that's necessarily going to happen for Captain Marvel, but I do think it proves that. As much as we all love these Avenger films and the team up in the long running MCU arc, sometimes something really new and exciting is what ultimately lights the biggest fire under people. Yeah, I'm definitely betting on a pretty big opening weekend for it. And I've been watching the early ticket sales too. And it's it's always exciting when you know a big release is coming up because even though certain other movies that are first coming out that weekend are doing well, the early ticket sales for something like that will wind up topping it. And things are looking pretty strong so far. So I'm curious to see how that changes over the course of the week, especially when reviews start to drop, which is very, very soon now. <laughs> yeah, it feels to me like would you go into the ocean when the water goes back and then comes crashing forward. It feels like January and February were pulling back and now we're going to get this huge wave from Captain Marvel. I know people talk about 140. I wouldn't be surprised to see 160 to 175 to be honest with you because I think there is a very strong groundswell happening of people wanting to see this movie. I think they'll go multiple times within the same weekend. You know, people thought it was crazy when I said Black Panther was going to make over 200 million and it did. So you just know, you don't know. Now these months and, and the desire and the hunger to see them to see a certain underrepresented uh Member of the members of the community see themselves represented so strongly in something like Captain Marvel, I think there's going to be a desire to see that over and over and over again and share it like Wonder Woman was multi-generationally. Before we leave box office, I know there's something that's kind of flying under the radar right now that Haley wants to give some love ah. to, and I don't blame you at all. Even though we had semi-different opinions about the <laughs> yeah. film, I kind of admire it for what they did. 
Well, I'm I'm just stoked to see that uh, Climax performed a bit this weekend. Very on brand for me to bring this tiny little horror movie into the <laughs> dance, conversation here. Dance horror, uh, dance is horror genre. Yes, very much so. Thank you. Uh, it's it's great. It, I think it went into five theaters mm-hmm. and ended up doing over a hundred thousand dollars, which is pretty solid. I'm excited for that as a start. If it's playing somewhere near you, you like weird stuff. You like Gaspar Noé. You're not afraid of some intense violence or extreme dance moves. Check it out. It's very that is good. A very good disclaimer <laughs> yeah. there. Heed that warning. I've really never seen anything like it. And even though I'm going to say it wasn't really for me, I still admire it if yeah. that makes much sense. So that's what I'll leave you with. <laughs> now we are going on to our next story, and this is a big one. You might have heard a little something about this topic the past couple of days. So Steven Spielberg recently ignited a major debate on Twitter, and it's over whether or not Netflix movies should be considered for Oscars. So Steven Spielberg is planning to voice these concerns at an upcoming Academy meeting. And his argument is that Netflix hurts theatrical distribution. He compared Netflix originals to TV movies, saying, I don't believe films that are just given token qualifications in a couple of theaters for less than a week should qualify for the Academy Award nomination. So now, of course, in the wake of Roma, taking three Oscars, including Best Director, Spielberg is basically playing plan to propose a rule change that would then rule Netflix films ineligible ineligible at the next Academy Awards. Oh boy, this is a, a lot to digest. So we've actually been covering this for a little while because over the past, I think, year or two, Spielberg has dropped little comments mm. here and there about mm. how he doesn't really appreciate uh, the streaming services and how they're being incorporated and how they're affecting theatrical distribution. So... Oh boy, I don't even know where to start. So Haley, I'm going to go to you first (laughs) and simply ask which side of this divide do you fall on? Is it Steven Spielberg or is it Netflix? I don't... I don't really uh, fall on either side. I, I wouldn't want to affiliate myself and be like, I'm team Netflix. Or I, Do I think that Steven Spielberg is right right now? No, I do not. I think that it's a very old school way of looking at things. But ultimately, I think this debate and why it's become such like a passionate conversation starter is it, it's a conversation that's about the future of the industry. It's not just this one issue. It's as it has been every time we bring up Steven Spielberg's qualms sort of with streaming, this is all about where, where does movie making and cinema go from here? And I don't, to me, like, of course, what he's saying or considering is a little, like, outdated and easy to dunk on, for sure. Like, who walks away from Roma and goes, that's a TV movie? That's just <laughs> kind of mind-blowing. Uh, but it's it's not something that I, I see as black and white or like I'm writing off his opinion wholeheartedly just out of hand. This is a complicated issue. It's, it's uh, as I've said before, I think that it's very tied into an issue of projection and how you receive your cinema. Uh, that's a battle that was kind of already lost, but a lot of old guard directors mm-hmm. aren't willing to give that up yet. And it's also complicated because like, Okay, I was a film lover my whole life, and I didn't know until I started really working in this industry what the actual qualifications for an Academy Award were. So I don't even agree with a lot of them. The the theatrical Mm -hmm. distribution element of it, I don't actually like, because many of my favorite movies of all time wouldn't have qualified Mm -hmm. because of those rules that I find somewhat arbitrary. So it's very complex. I do not have a side. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, that's the dangerous thing about having this kind of conversation on Twitter. And, you know, I've been pouring through these comments all day long. And, you know, Twitter basically gives a black and white representation of this whole argument where I either agree with him or this is the stupidest thing ever. And he's just an (laughs) old guy now. So I think that when you really dig into some of the details, it raises so many more questions. And I think both sides of this conversation are so well worth having, because if he doesn't voice concerns like this, then I I do think we run the risk of the theatrical experience probably completely going away. But at the same time, this is a changing distribution landscape and the Academy needs to change. And there are so many other things that need to change in order to basically last and evolve with all of these streaming services coming in and completely changing the game. We have Netflix now a member of the MPAA. They're probably going to play with these 90 day theatrical windows. Amazon is kind of taking a step back from it. There is no doubt in my mind that the next couple of years we're going to see major shifts like this across the board. And if this is the way to at least start taking steps forward with this conversation and figuring out new rules that will make everybody happy and 
really give representation to every kind of film. Because the other thing that was pointed out, actually, it's from the Netflix tweet. So in response to Spielberg's comments, Netflix tweeted, we love cinema, and they continued by listing things that they love, which include access for people who can't always afford or live in towns without theaters, letting everyone everywhere enjoy releases at the same time, and giving filmmakers more way to share art. And you can't close the door on a company like Netflix when that statement is very true. I forgot who I was talking to the other day, but they told me that the general stat across the country is that most people see four movies a year, just four movies yeah. in the theater. And, you know, it could be for a variety of reasons. Maybe that's all they could afford or maybe that's all they choose to see. But in a situation where either you don't have access to see certain movies in the theater because of where you live, or maybe you don't have the means to see tons of movies out there, the idea of Netflix offering a subscription that you could pay and then watch as many as you want. I mean, isn't that what we all want? People to see more movies? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's important to like remember though as well that Netflix is not this altruistic, it's not a charity. They're mm. they're a corporation trying to make money. And those are the things that I I find somewhat concerning or that I would I would like to see changes made on is how much at, you know the discussion of how much are they allowed to spend in their campaigning versus mm -hmm. other studios or uh, uh, things like this, they don't release their numbers unless it makes them look good. You know, there is a, a lack of accountability at Netflix that when it comes to, because the rules aren't written yet. They have to be written. That's what this process exactly. is that we're going through right now. And it's going to be a lot of sort of like fist fights on Twitter until we figure it out. But it's, they're not, you know, they're not your best friend. They are a company. Mm -hmm. Two things. Right. Two, two <laughs> I can things see you really no, no, it's <laughs> okay. No, listen, no, no. It's, it's two things you, two that you guys are used to doing a podcast. I get it. Two things that you have to look at though. And I, and I think we have to state is that Steven Spielberg is not alone in this. And maybe people don't want to hear that. And like you said, Perry, it is black and white on Twitter, but I think Haley brings up a great point. It's way more complex than that. And that's what you have to look at here. Spielberg is the governor of this division. There are many years, remember when Spielberg first started, they didn't want to give this young pup an Oscar at all. They shut him out of nominations for a long time, making him earn his keep. So maybe he's got a little bit of responsibility in his mind of gatekeeping and trying to preserve of these older directors that he fell in love with, this idea of film that he fell in love with. So that's his impetus here. And also maybe saving the theatrical distribution, theaters themselves. As you mentioned, Perry, very important thing. So there's multiple layers to this. Yes, do I disagree with them? I tweeted that on Saturday. I thoroughly disagree with his thoughts. I think this is the way that it's going. We've been saying it on the show for quite some time. I personally believe that theater chains are almost, they're going to die. It's going to become an exclusive thing to go see. Maybe you pay $75 like the theater, actual Broadway type theater. You go and see one movie. Like I said, four movies a year. People will shell out a little bit extra to get the experience of seeing a movie. So I get what he's defending. It just feels in the end like Don Quixote going at the windmills. Progress <laughs> is undefeated. Progress will always march on and stomp uh, anybody in the way in the old guard and move forward. Streaming is progress. Streaming is going to happen. And I think Alfonso Cuaron had a great response when he said... How many theater chains do you think were willing to put mm -hmm. a film like mm -hmm. this in their theaters and willing to, because you know what theaters, they have to make money. So it's a business. Do they think they're going to let Roma go for two or three weeks if only 10 people are coming to see it per screening? That's an important thing as well. So to me, I think Spielberg's being a little narrow-minded, but I understand why he's being narrow-minded because he feels he's defending a certain system that he was brought up in, and I can't fault him for that. See, but that's the thing. I don't necessarily think that Spielberg is flat out wrong, but I right. think he is going about it in uh, the basically a, a not great way. I don't want to call it a wrong way, but I think mm -hmm. it it might wind up hurting a little bit and it could be completely different because what we're getting right now is is like surface level quotes on the situation. So all I keep hearing in my mind is, "Oh, reduce uh, Netflix to to uh, made for TV movies and shut Netflix out of the Oscars." Yeah, yeah, yeah. That all sounds to me like putting something down. That's not what mm -hmm. we want to do. We want to be inclusive and include more things. And for all I know, whatever he proposes at this meeting, those are going to have like the little minutia type details that are going to show, you know, I guess opportunities for real long-term change that don't necessarily put 
individuals, like certain filmmakers that are already at a disadvantage at even more of a disadvantage because, oh, if only Netflix is going to fund your movie, you can't be eligible for an Oscar. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I want to see the bullet points of this proposal here. Well, and he, has, he's, he has a history of doing this. He was against DVDs when they first started coming out. Mm-hmm. Remember him and George Lucas proposed a whole separate type of way of watching home video and it was a, a thing you could get and after three views it would, it would stop working. So they had their own personal thing. So he's always had, I think he's on the cutting edge of technology as long as he's involved in it. And if he's not, then it's it doesn't work for him. But he has to understand so many people have discovered his older movies on streaming services, on DVD or Blu-ray or even 4K, what have you. And so that's why it's not something that should be shut out or shut away. But I think Perry make a great point. Him calling them TV movies. Martin Scorsese, his contemporary, is about to release The Irishman. And yes, they're getting a theatrical release, but it's going to be on Netflix initially. And these films aren't made with TV movie sensibilities. That's the difference. I get the point, but he's off on the point because these movies aren't being made with a TV movie type of approach. They're being made with a longer, wider approach, feature filmmaking approach. That's why these feature filmmakers are getting involved. I don't even know that the term TV movie holds much value anymore mm-hmm. or means anything what it used to. And we now, the, the thing that irks like TV writers is all these film directors come into TV and they go, it's really, it's really like an eight hour movie and TV writers like no it's television stop it so this everything in the industry has evolved to a point right. where we're redefining the terms even you touch on the idea that maybe he's gate something he gatekeeping yeah. something he believes in but like that that gets to the heart of I think why this is striking people so exactly. personally like this also has to do with who gets to mm-hmm. make movies mm. and that is an age-old problem that is just now finding a new way to become a controversy, right. then he, I'm sure he doesn't mean to insidiously be like, only these people and these types of filmmakers that I grew up respecting get to make movies, right. but well, that's kind of what he's doing. That's why Ava DuVernay's tweet is fantastic. She said, you know, mm-hmm. she pushes back, I want to be in that room to have that right. conversation with you when you go and do it. There were a little, uh, a whole bunch of very strong responses to this on Twitter, mm-hmm. but one in particular I wanted to focus on here is someone who actually suggested something that could kind of be a compromise that I found interesting. And I know this isn't a guaranteed win. There's probably all these little details that you'd have to iron out for anything like this to work. But it's from Sean Baker, the guy who directed Tangerine and also the Florida Project. Mm. And he said, wouldn't it be great if Netflix offered a theatrical tier to their pricing plans? For a nominal fee, Netflix members could see Netflix films in theaters for free. I know I'd spend an extra $2 a month to see films like Roma or Buster Scruggs on the big screen. You can do what that. What make you of that? You can do that. Sign up for the AMC thing and you can go right in the theater and see all the movies you want to see for 20 bucks a month. There you go. There's your model. It already exists. But ne- theaters shouldn't be working in conjunction with Netflix to get people into their theater to see screenings for free. I think that's a dangerous business model that will sink the theaters just as quickly as not. Haley. It's yet another extremely complicated. <laughs> Netflix has Netflix has essentially uh, dissolved the lines between producer and distributor mm-hmm. to an extent that we again haven't. The culture hasn't caught up with fully understanding how to deal with that yet, and which is why we recently had the debates about could Netflix have their own theater chains? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is that against the Constitution? <laughs> or not the Constitution, but the law. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like we're like, is that illegal? I think that's illegal. Point of order. And, Point yeah. of yeah, is that I mean, monopoly? I think that kind of gets at it, though. It's that yeah. we we need the rules overall to be changing. Right. I do think Baker is onto something, though. I don't necessarily think that the root with this kind of idea would be, oh, pay two extra dollars and get the movies for free in mm. theaters. But if there was some sort of theatrical tier, and again, I'm not saying I know the answer to the specifics of exactly what it would need to be in order for it to work, but I mean that could be a happy medium between honoring the original Netflix business model, but also finding some sort of, you know, middle ground with theaters and Netflix in order to get their product into theaters in in a way that, I don't know, I guess it's kind of organic to what they're doing rather than forced. But then don't you worry that the studios start to strong arm theaters and going like, you got to show this movie. If you want this movie, you better show this movie. This is what they did back in the 30s and yeah. the 40s. They strong arm theaters to take their other films <laughs> so they could get the bigger films in their theaters. And the, that's where it becomes see, dangerous. This is the problem though. Yeah. And and this is why like, I, I am not an idiot. Mm. I know this industry is a business, but this yeah. is pro- part of the problem is that there is so much red tape and 
and so much unnecessary control out there that that's part of the reason we're but we're being shoved into these kinds of corners now it's because it's a business everyone wants to make money everyone wants to rise to the top and no one is willing to play nice and that's not cool and i think that part (laughs) part of it is represented in how much money is being spent on oscar campaigns i mean that's another rule that's very easy to fix in my eyes limit the studios to yeah. spending a certain amount. Mm-hmm. Why has that not been done yet? Because that, to me, completely takes away what the meaning of an Oscar is if you're just, like, shelling out money all day in order to get it. And mm-hmm. I know this is a little bit of a tangent, but that brings uh, brings me back to one of your points, which was the idea of Netflix not revealing box office profits. I saw a whole bunch of people harping on that. And even though you guys know I love numbers and I want to know the answers to those questions, mm-hmm. I don't even necessarily think that that should even be a rule to have to reveal the because I mean look at how the amount of money a movie made this year affected the conversation yeah. mm-hmm. but uh, you know, I guess that's going to affect it no matter what once you have a general idea how wide something went or how many people saw it but I'm not so hung up on them releasing that kind of data in order to be accepted by the Academy mm-hmm. I'm not either. For me, that issue is more a matter of, like you said, it determines the conversation. So by only releasing the data that favors them and makes them look good, they are controlling the conversation in a way that's allowed to be a lot less honest than numbers that are just transparent. I think that's... It, sh- that's it a, shouldn't control the, right. the conversation, it, though. It should. You're right. And yeah, that's but, the, it, that's, but it does. That's the compromise that should happen to the tweet. That's the tweet that should be. You, you want to be considered for Oscars? Here's a compromise. You have to release your numbers for the films if you put them in the theater or... Put them on your streaming service. You have to release the view numbers for everything. I think that's a fair compromise to make. Oh, Good luck. <laughs> yeah, right. Of course. But it's this a is compromise. a conversation that will no doubt continue. And when this meeting happens, we will probably cover it. So get ready to discuss this further very soon. Before we move on to our next story, though, I want to remind you, we are going to save a little time for your live Twitter questions at the end of the show. Send them in right now. Use the hashtag Collider Movie Talk. Send in new different ones. Don't send in the same one because it's not going to get picked. Hopefully you guys come up with something creative and we'll have a lot of fun. Next up is a casting story for you. And it's about the new Ghostbusters movie. So this one was developed in secrecy by Jason Reitman. And of course, he is the son of Ivan Reitman, who directed the first two Ghostbuster movies. And now we are learning via Variety that Finn Wolfhard and Carrie Coon are in talks to star in this new movie. The story will reportedly follow a single mom and her family with Coon playing the mom and Wolfhard playing her son. Filming on this movie is expected to begin this summer in anticipation of of a July 10th, 2020 release. So hopefully we'll get even more casting details soon. But Haley, where do you uh, stand on the two that we got already? Well, I I worship in the house of Carrie Coon, so I'm just thrilled whenever she gets anything. And this is wonderful. I hope that we get to see Carrie Coon busting ghosts because we're not totally sure uh, the plot or, you know, we just got that one log line. But I I would be very sad if she did not get to partake of the action. Mm -hmm. Uh, Finn Wolfhard is great, too. I mean, like, who doesn't like that kid at this point? He's he's done no wrong. He's really leaned into his success in the genre, which I find very appealing in an actor when you have something, you know, genre fans who love you and you continue to return to that. That makes me happy. So I think it's great casting. It's exciting. I'm I'm curious to see how the rest of the cast fills out. Mm-hmm. If this is it really focused on this family, or are we going to get some surprising names in there? What do we get? I don't know. I do like the idea of at least starting with the family. Yeah. And it, it is kind of making me hope. Like I'm sure they're going to cast friends for Finn kind of thing. But right. the idea of Ghostbusters or like a new iteration of the Ghostbusters having a family vibe versus a whole bunch of people the same age, that kind of intrigues me a little because it feels so different. But I don't know, Roka, where do you stand on this particular log line and this casting and what that could do for this new movie in the franchise uh all right casting wise great stuff uh, i i'm with uh hayley carrie coon i i worship at her altar as well ever since uh i saw her in uh that season of fargo like that oh, really yeah. that really blew me away i went that and that motivated me to go back and revisit leftovers yes. she's incredible she's incredible and of course I didn't even know that that was her who played the sister in Gone, uh, Gone Girl. Girl. Like yeah. I had to go back and figure that out because of the glasses. It threw me off. And so all of that to see her uh, now grabbing this situation is great. Film Wolfhard, like you said, uh, obviously with it and everything else, like coming back to that kind of 80s genre vibe, great. My concern is, 
do we really need another Ghostbusters after that situation that happened with the ladies? Like, it's like, we just, let's move past this. Let's move on to something else. I don't know what's going to come out of it, to be honest with you. A family approach is great. Kind of reminds me of the animated series that happened for a little bit. Maybe they'll take that yeah. kind of approach to it. But the question is, yeah, how do you take an, a family approach to Ghostbusters? Will it be a haunting that causes the Ghostbusters to come and then that inspires the kid to become a Ghostbuster or Carrie Coon to be a Ghostbuster? Who knows? But to me, I'm just like, I don't know why we want to revisit this after what happened, after what happened with the whole controversy and the anger and the frustration. And then they clumsily rolled it out. Jason did. And he had to go back and apologize on Twitter about how he felt like they were just, and then Paul Feig had to come and defend him. So it was just like, it was, it was, it was a clumsy rollout. And I just wonder about it overall, if this thing is just cursed. I, I don't know if I would go as far to say curse. And I see the value in it. I mean, it's mm. one of the most popular franchises well, out there. Sure, sure, it does sure. not surprise me whatsoever that they wound up trying again. And I do have a lot of faith in Jason Reitman. But going back to our conversation the very first day we heard about this mm. is that kind, I mean, his comments were one thing, but that kind of backlash was inevitable no matter what, just because after 2016 and all of the yeah. negativity that was around that movie, the second you announce another one without those ladies, it is mm. automatically going to spark that kind of conversation and I don't think that's a good thing but if I'm able to just block that out and sadly I think that we're getting this movie no matter yeah, what yeah. and I'm going to try to enjoy it while I still get to like that 2016 movie because I was a fan of that one mm -hmm. but in this particular case, I think at least with a casting, with a, from a casting perspective sure. and also from a story perspective, there is enough here that intrigues me that I think I'm open to this being the next installment of the Ghostbuster franchise. I'm interested. You said something that made me nervous, though, like casting friends for film, Finn Wolfhard, and I think my sort of nightmare scenario of this film, I just realized, would be if they tried to do it Stranger Things style movie with the Ghostbusters. Mm -hmm. I just have no interest in that. There's no way they're not going to do that, though. I would hate that so much. I, like, I don't <laughs> do this. What if, it, <laughs> what if it's a prequel already, slash reboot? I don't know. I don't know. At what point is the cannibalization, like the self cannibalization, mm. too much? We just had mm. Stranger Things dressed up as Ghostbusters, yeah. and now the star of Stranger Things is going to be in Ghostbusters. And are they going to be a Stranger Things? style team of children ghost busting ah, I can't do it I, I don't care for that I really don't care for I hope it's a family I don't like that at all yeah. oh, that's I my two cents I definitely <laughs> lean towards the family but I don't know just the logical like piece of my brain is working right now and it just it seems so obvious like even if yeah, too obvious. even if it is largely a family uh, mm -hmm. approach to the story you know that there's going to be some sort of B plot where him and his friends are doing something well sure he's the kid's allowed to have friends yeah. I just don't want to see Stranger Things, but now they're Ghostbusters. Like. Or, or like the Losers Ghostbusters. Yeah, yeah okay. or we got those already. <laughs> we didn't, what happens when they cast a couple of these friends female or of, you know, or of uh, people of color? Like what happened? I know we had Winston, but what do we do? Will there be a backlash for that? There's, so, there's all kinds of things that it's walking the line of that I, I get nervous about. But casting wise... I think all of us agree I, <laughs> yeah. that we're happy with this because we love both of these actors. The question is, will they be able to avoid the minefield that this is going to be before they, before the thing releases? Roka, I do not believe that there is a way to avoid the minefield in this world that we live in anymore. <laughs> we are true. in the minefield. That's the minefield point. is our home. Tom Hanks hey. seems to be escaping it really well still. <laughs> no, so That's true. That's true. <laughs> He's it's the one true. guy I point to, yeah. You know what the way is to avoid the minefield? Just express your concern, your dissatisfaction in sure. a pleasant way that's not attacking anyone and then we could all live happily ever after. Isn't that crazy? Who would have thunk? All right, we got one more story to hit today. It is a new trailer for Shazam. You guys know the details. I'm not running through them right now. We got this new trailer. It leans super heavy into the comedy. So, Roka, what do you think yeah. of this trailer? Is it fun, silly, different kind of vibe for you, or is it too silly? Uh, yeah, I mean, we saw the silly already in every one of these trailers. This one leaned a little too heavily in the silly, and it scares me a little bit. Now, uh, look, don't come after me, DC. God damn it. I, I'm a massive Captain Marvel fan. Massive, massive, massive Captain Marvel fan, so I will fight you in the streets. Uh, but this situation, I just, this trailer for me, although it was nice to see Mark Strong get some more screen time, for me, this trailer kind of scared me a little bit that we're going to get a little too goofy and not enough of uh, believability uh, in this character and in what the, what uh, Zachary Levi is doing with Billy, the Billy Batson adult version of 
of it. So uh, that concerns me. We'll see how they lay the groundwork out in the beginning of the relationship with him being a foster kid and that, being friends with that uh, that kid from uh, from uh, Stranger Things as well, uh, it, right? Or from uh, it, from it. It, it, it? Sorry, from it. Jack it, Dylan Grazer. Jack Dylan. Yeah, the relationship there. I think if they lay the groundwork there, I'll be fine with all the goofiness coming out afterwards. It's just you know when you saw Big Tom Hanks did a fantastic job bringing a kid to life in that way. I wonder if Zachary is playing a kid rather than embodying a kid, and that's what kind of occurred to me as I was watching this trailer. So nothing exactly. I love Zachary Chuck and everything else, but like to me, it, this trailer left me a little bit concerned. They're going to try to be really funny as opposed to actually like something grounded. I can tell you got something to say. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I don't know. You had that face on. That's just my face when I listen to Roka talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I like the trailer. I think it looks fun. I, I agree with a lot of what you said. Not, I'm not worried about it being too silly, but mm. I do think that nailing the relationship aspect is really important. And I think that's why I actually preferred the previous trailer. This one didn't have as much emotional weight to mm -hmm. it, and uh, was you know it showed off more of the action, which is fine, and that was interesting to me because it does actually. This action looks right at home in the rest of the DCU mm. as it exists. I wasn't sure exactly what it would look like since it is kind of a more fun, lighthearted movie. But really, like when he moves and gets into action, he looks like he could fit in right alongside mm. what we've seen in Aquaman and Justice League and all that. So that was cool to see. I'm I'm for it. I'm not worried about it. I think it looks really good. But I just mm. I hope it has that heart in it because I think that's what what will prevent it from becoming what Roka's worried about. Well, and they might be leaning towards a more comic booky tone when you right. see how Aquaman was done, you see how this looks. It, there may be, that this may be the new DCEU approach is a more comic booky tone. I, want, I don't to necessarily think that's the new DC approach. Mm -hmm. I think the new DC approach is what we had covered recently, which is pretty much focus on one movie, one story, one character, True. make it their thing, make them all different, and basically build a franchise that way instead of trying to reverse engineer everything and thus far given how Aquaman did I think it's working in their favor and this is oddly enough been my most anticipated of all the DC films and I say oddly because I knew nothing about Shazam before mm. they started rolling out stuff from this movie and it's it is something about the big vibe it's that story that no matter what no matter how you tweak certain little details it'll always get at me because also like what 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 kid out there doesn't dream of being an adult? But like, what adult out there can't have fun with the fantasy of like a a kid being in an adult body, let alone an adult superhero body? So I get a kick out of the whole concept, and I've liked the different vibes that some of the trailers had. And I would be worried about this being too silly if this trailer hadn't made me laugh out loud a couple mm. of times, and it definitely did. I would say the Batman joke, I thought that was very, very funny. Mm -hmm. And then the button at the end. That, that killed when he, me. When he crashes through yeah, yeah, yeah. into the, the office building, uh. I was laughing out loud. And that's kind of what I want from this. I want the fun, I want the zaniness, I want the humor, and then I want the relationship between Zach Levi and Jack Dylan Grazer. And based on what I've seen from the two of them thus far, there is kind of no doubt in my mind that they're gonna nail that. I think they missed, they missed a boat not having Destiny Child say my name on that trailer because they say say my name the whole time <laughs> and using the, using the Eminem track I love Eminem but I thought the Destiny Child's say my name would have been a better maybe uh, they couldn't so. afford it now, yeah it's Beyonce really is you yeah, never know she's expensive alright one thing we do know though is that there is so much content on Collider for you and this very first thing that we're going to talk about is a certain show that John Roca does he's always <laughs> excited to plug it yeah. what happened on Sports Time yeah. We, we, uh, it was great to be back hosting it. Uh, Makuga joined us with Mark Ellis. The three of us just talked about the Bryce Harper contract signing, some of the NFL news, Antonio Brown. And we got a bunch of NHL conversations going on. Also, storming the court. Are we done with that kind of thing in college basketball? So a lot was covered today in live uh, uh, broadcast of Sports Time. You can find it on the College Sports YouTube channel and on the podcast feed to hear the three of us go nuts about a bunch of stuff in sports. And Haley, there might be a little something called the witching hour that yeah airs tomorrow tell everybody about what we did of course so yes i mentioned my love for climax and we had miss <laughs> sophia butella on this week to ask her all about how they pulled off that film which is really quite something when you'll see it you'll wonder why we were confused on how it happened um <laughs> we also talked about working with gaspar noe and uh we talked a lot about her her transition from she had a very successful career as a dancer mm -hmm. and becoming an actress it was a lovely chat she's a lovely woman and you should definitely tune in tomorrow it, yeah you really should it was a great conversation and just to plug a little something extra that's uh, circling around on the social medias right now we also 
show showed Sophia Batella a clip from an interview I did with her and Sam Jackson five years ago. I'm not going to spoil what it is, but you're going to want to watch that. I certainly get a kick out of it. So check it out on the Collider video Twitter account right now. And real quick, oh. Sophia Butella introduced Perry to fainting <gasps> goats. This don't, you will not want to miss. Don't do it. <laughs> I'm not going to queue up a video don't right now. You, you really don't want to miss that moment because I lost a solid like three minutes of my life because I was in tears laughing at these. I feel so bad for them. I feel Fine. so bad for them because it's a condition that makes mm. their muscles seize up. But it's so it's cute. It, it's so funny. Um, we also have a brand new episode of Collider Live for you tomorrow. Of course, Movie Talk at 4 p.m. PT, live again. And then on top of that, there might be a big review coming your way tomorrow. It might be a review of Captain Marvel. And it feels necessary to remind you yet again, tell us your opinions. We want to know what you think about the movie. We want to know what you guys want to talk about, have conversations with each other. Please be respectful. There's really no reason whatsoever to do anything other than that. Let's keep this community clean, fair, loving, exciting, and just passionate about movie making overall. So keep that in mind and keep an eye out for our Captain Marvel review. Alrighty, live Twitter questions. <laughs> I hope you are ready for these. I have to pick one that pertains to Shazam first. I love this question. Uh, Maggie Ledbetter wrote, if you could have superpowers but needed a transformation call like Shazam, <laughs> what would it be? Roka, pick something other than Outlaw. Too obvious. Sacagawea! Uh, that sounds good to me. <laughs> I thought you were, <laughs> were going to say gravitas. <laughs> <laughs> I feel uh, like that would be your word. Yeah. You got to so, own it. Something British. It would be something <laughs> British, I'm sure. <laughs> what you got? I'm, it'd have to be something real stupid that made me laugh every time. I don't think I could do it seriously. It'd be like groovy or something. <laughs> I don't know. You could own that. <laughs> Meow. <laughs> Because yeah, I, I am a cat lady. Yeah, I was going to say Dewey. Yeah, Dewey. I go. feel like that would be a little weird, but it's fine. I will own it. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, now this next question comes from, uh, and I remember what you told me. I, th I think he told me to just say Donnie next time. Oh. So I'm saying that, not your full name. Um, Donnie is asking, with the Spielberg versus Netflix debate, I was wondering, just as a fun question, what's your favorite movie theater chain growing up? Oh. oh. Growing up. Growing up, yeah. I feel like it, it's compl a completely different experience growing up because it yeah. was making me think back to being a kid and like when your parents would actually take you. I mean, it's almost like growing up on Long Island and when I was a little kid and I went into Manhattan, it was always like we were going to the city. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, of course. And it's completely different when you get older and you're able to drive yourself into Manhattan. I'm old enough where we didn't have theater chains, so I can tell you uh, I didn't have any growing up until AMC came around. When AMC came around, that's when I understood what theater chains were and what they're so. That's what I grew up with in Virginia. And hey, they still do those pretzel bites, and that's why I enjoy the hell out of that <laughs> AMC theater chain. Nice. And you could sneak into other movies. I'll tell you the truth. When you couldn't afford it, like me. How dare like you? Like me, I can't afford it. Like like uh, a lot of people talk about with the Netflix debate, can't, they can't afford to go to the theater multiple times. Mm -hmm. I used to sneak in and see other movies. That's how it became, I became such a massive film fan was seeing so many different types of movies. I feel sneaking like you in. can't do that as much anymore no, now you that I think that about it. No, nowadays. Yeah, it's huh. really tough to do now. Interesting. Where were you going to the movies? Uh, we were lucky, I guess. So we lived in a place with a lot of different chains. So, but it was an Edwards, and then it was a Regal that we went to all the time, and it was it was our mm. little family spot. I loved that place, and then I ended up working there for like seven years, all through college. So. Regal, I guess, was a very important part of my life. Okay. Yeah. I don't remember what chain it was. I just remember I just remember kind of like the town and the fascination with the standees because they always oh, had, yeah. it was just always like a teeny tiny lobby with standees, like so many of them that they basically like lined the wall. And the one in particular that I'll, I'll never forget is the one for Congo. Oh, because I think oh. Congo came out right around the Jurassic Park time, so or a little after at least, and I was freaking fascinated by that movie. Yeah, <laughs> so I had to see it, but I I miss those days of going with the family, and I don't know, it just had like nice. that different magical quality. It's I yeah, that's a 
one of my favorite things my family did like i'm i'm so grateful that i had a dad who was a big movie nerd and he would take Mm. me to go to the movies some of my favorite memories i still have dreams about that movie theater as often as like the place i grew up like i mean as often as the apart that apartment that i grew Mm. up in is that movie theater i have that with this movie theater that i'm kind of like visually designing for you guys right now because it's also the theater that i saw jurassic park in for the first time (laughs) which actually makes me think another thing that most movie theaters i feel like don't have anymore based on how they're designed is you remember when movie theaters you used to just and I'm sure there's some still out there like this but when you would walk you know straight out through the door and there was like a little bit of light that would creep in through that rectangular window oh, yeah. they don't really have that anymore anywhere no which is probably a good thing Spielberg banned it Spielberg banned yeah, it yeah <laughs> well if, if Spielberg had banned that my little sister never would have seen Jurassic Park as a kid because when the T-Rex breaks out of its paddock Lonnie was like up and out and the rest of the movie I would turn around and my dad would be holding her up in the little window to watch the rest of the movie I will never forget that <laughs> All right. This next question is from Grant, and he wants to know thoughts on the Leaving Neverland documentary. So I know you two haven't caught this yet. Any interest? Any plans? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I almost watched it this morning. The, my girlfriend doesn't want to see it, so mm. I mean, we live together, so I have to like respect that on the television. But this morning, I almost popped it on, but I read a fantastic article in the New York Times about it, detailing 10 of the facts out of that documentary before I even watched it that are unrefuta- irrefutable. And so that really kind of unsettled me in reading about how descriptive this documentary is and how graphic in detail it is is incredibly upsetting i will definitely be watching it and uh, i will re- i'm recording tonight the oprah response to it where she's having the, the two kids on there yeah. the conversation so i have an interest a very strong interest in it i just i'm gonna have to find the time while she's asleep to watch it <laughs> I, I read some of the mm. details as well and read the quotes and just decided that this was not a film that I need to partake in personally. I can understand that. Um, for what it's worth, I've watched about three quarters of it now. I wasn't able to finish about the last 45 minutes this morning before yeah. coming into work. But for what it's worth, from a documentary filmmaking perspective, once I started it, it was very difficult to stop. Mm. It's like my plan was to watch part one and then you know take a break and watch part two the next day, if not the day after, and I didn't. I went straight into it, and the only reason I did stop this morning is because I had to come into the office, but heed Haley's warning. It is a very, very difficult to watch. It, it's deeply upsetting, so just brace yourself if you do go into it, and I gotta end the show on a fun note here, so I'm going back to Donnie for this, because <laughs> this conversation also, you know, we're basically talking about like distribution and all different ways to digest media at this point. And he was asking for our favorite video store chain back in the day. I mean, is anybody else's not, not Blockbuster? Yeah. Like Blockbuster is mine. Is uh, that the one and only? Uh, yeah. Well, for renting, for buying, we had the warehouse. Did you guys have the warehouse? Yeah, I remember the warehouse. That's where I went to buy all my stuff. We had a Hollywood video. Oh, it, yeah. it was like one or the other. Yeah, with, we had both, I think. With us in Virginia, it was Video World or Blockbuster. Those were the two. But Video, Video World was first. That was the, it was this yellow and brown with a reel and Video World. And you, you, they had the, and you had, the, like, there were sections where you couldn't go in if you were a certain age. That kind of mm-hmm. stuff. You, you know, anything R-rated, you couldn't just go walk up at a high school and get. And then Blockbuster came, and that pretty much, like, spread like, mm-hmm. wow. It was like Starbucks, Blockbuster. But... Video World was the first video store that I remember in my hometown. Would you walk in and go straight to the Western's aisle? No. Did, was there a Western aisle? Not at that time. No, 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 no. I just go in and, and, and initially it was all the comedies. I'd rent them over to all the sports movies and then eventually I got all the classics and then Westerns, of course. I yeah. would go straight to horror. I'm assuming uh, yeah. you would do the same. Yeah, I was all over the place. I so when I worked at the movie theater, there was a blockbuster right mm. like I don't next door almost, and so I would go after work at the theater and just go pick up like eight movies for the week. And I would I stopped in every section. Mm. I was all over that. I definitely beelined for horror, and it's like <laughs> because of the browsing in Blockbuster. You know how like you get those VHS uh, visuals just completely ingrained in your head yeah. for the rest of your life. It's like that's where I was first exposed to Silence of the Lambs. Uh-huh. Like I will never forget that VHS box cover ever, ever, ever. And I mean specifically what that art looks like on a VHS tape. Right. Absolutely, yeah, that was iconic yeah. artwork. It's- so, and for whatever reason, it was always in the horror section, but also up front, mm-hmm. like yeah. where you would think new releases would be, but like it's almost like the classic section that you had to see it every single time you left. 
They probably kept horror up front to like keep an eye on the rowdy kids. <laughs> like me, not yeah. really. <laughs> All right, that's it. We are out of time today. We got a premiere to go to, and Roke has a screening to go to. Yeah. So we are all going to indulge in some <laughs> Captain Marvel tonight. I tried to make it positive. No, I knew when a, I said that your face was going to get sour. No, I, look, I don't need to go to the screen, <laughs> uh, the premiere. I'm fine. Going to the screen, I just want to see the film, and I'm excited to go tonight. Good, so I'm, I'm glad. I hope everyone has guys. fun and enjoys. Guys, thank you so much for watching the show. Show. As always, I got to thank Roka and Haley for being here today. Adam in the booth back there. Thank you for all your hard work. Guys, like and share this episode. Tell everybody you know about Movie Talk on the Collider Video YouTube channel and also in podcast form as well. And then tune in tomorrow, 4 p.m. PT for a brand new episode.